Hello, my name is Russell Lewis. I'm an associate professor of infectious disease at the University of Padua. As part of the guidelines committee, I help prepare the section on pharmacokinetic considerations and therapeutic drug monitoring. So it's my pleasure to provide a little bit of an overview of some of the key topics we try to address in this section. Now, why do we think pharmacokinetic variability in drug dosing and TDM is necessary for invasive candidiasis? Well, many patients who develop invasive candidiasis are critically ill, and they have multiple factors that contribute to the variability in the pharmacokinetics of antifungal agents, which makes the risk of underdosing or overdosing much more problematic compared to less critically ill patients. So for example, age, sex, and body size uh, can change the volume of distribution. We also know that inflammation and sepsis will change the volume of distribution and metabolism of antifungal agents, not to mention the patient's inherent pharmacogenetic ability to metabolize drugs such as voriconazole. Drug interactions continue to be a major issue, especially in these populations that will affect the pharmacokinetics. But even things like protein binding, uh, changes in um, albumin concentrations, hypoalbuminemia is common in critically ill patients, and this can change the volume of distribution of drugs. We also know that these patients have many cases will have organ dysfunction, particularly renal dysfunction, and if extracorporeal circuits are being used, such as renal replacement therapies, um, or in some cases ECMO, bypass, this changes considerably uh, the volume of distribution of some antifungal agents and really necessitates um, a individualized dosing approach. So these factors are often occurring concurrently and it's sometimes very difficult to predict uh, how it will affect the exposure to antifungal agents. We also know that um, antifungals are frequently underdosed in the ICU. Um, recent work from Jason Roberts and colleagues published in the SAFE ICU study, which was actually published after the guidelines were completed, uh, really paint a very clear picture of why TDM may be more important than previously thought. This was a pharmacokinetic point prevalence study in 30 ICUs, 12 different countries, and over 339 patients. So basically, they went into these ICUs and they sampled patients at two different time periods with three samples per dosing interval to estimate the pharmacokinetic exposures for three classes of antifungals, triazoles, echinocandins, and polynes. And what they found, I think, was really um, quite compelling that if you look at patients who are receiving antifungals for treatment, not prophylaxis for treatment, and what type of exposures they achieved in the first 72 hours, um, only 80.7% of fluconazole treated patients were achieving necessary exposures. Only 52.9% of voriconazole treated patients achieved target PKP uh, targets. Posaconazole, 37.5%, and mycofungin and liposomal amphotericin B were between 41.7 to 67%. So clearly there's some problems with our dosing of antifungal agents. The question then is what can we do to improve this situation? And as with antibacterials, the main approaches that are currently recommended are to consider these patient specific physiological factors that impact antifungal dosing and also your local susceptibility data, depending on what type of resistance uh, issues you may have in your institution, that could certainly affect your dosing that you're using empirically. We certainly need to think about optimizing the PKPD of drugs with the doses that we're selecting and the administration strategies. And of course, therapeutic drug monitoring. If we have therapeutic drug monitoring available, uh, can we adjust dosing to achieve desired target ranges? And when putting together this guideline, um, this One World Health Guideline, we recognize that TDM is not necessarily available in all centers. And even in Europe, for example, this paper showing the ECMM survey of invasive fungal disease diagnostic capability across Europe, it was well clearly illustrated that in many centers, less resource centers, therapeutic drug monitoring is simply not available or it's a send out test and may not be reported in a timely fashion. So we try to take that into account with making our recommendations. The drug we should start with is fluconazole because it's still the most frequently prescribed drug for invasive candidiasis. And there are many scenarios that are associated with altered pharmacokinetics, things such as obesity, uh, sepsis, high volume fluid resuscitation, and possibly even ECMO uh, will change the volume and distribution of the drug and can lead to much lower drug exposures than anticipated. 
There's certainly also many factors that affect the clearance. Fluconazole is clearance cleared primarily through the kidneys. And there's always been a recommendation to reduce dosages in renal impairment. But on the other hand, some subset of patients may have augmented renal clearance and actually clearing fluconazole too rapidly. Or patients who are on continuous venovenous hemodifiltration, high volume uh, dialysis, uh, you can actually have much higher clear rates than patients with normal intact renal function. So this can lead to low exposures. Sometimes loading doses are not administered, and that's a mistake because um, the loading dose is important for achieving those early therapeutic concentrations of the drug. We also know that if the infection that we're trying to treat with fluconazole is in a difficult site, uh, such as the central nervous system or the eye, the vitreous fluid, um, there may be low blood exposure. There may be low exposures at this site of infection, even though the penetration of fluconazole is generally considered to be quite good. So um, this is all exacerbated, of course, if you're treating an isolate that has a higher MIC. So we try to be very clear with our recommendations of fluconazole dosing that a loading dose does need to be administered in the guidelines and a maintenance dose of six milligrams per kilogram once daily adjusted for renal function is the appropriate maintenance dose in general. Now, if you're dealing with a more resistant pathogen, or a more difficult site of infection, therapeutic drug monitoring, if it's available, would be indicated. And we have a good idea of the targets, uh, generally an area under the curve to MIC of greater than 100, or if you accept a, the typical breakpoint of two, then this would be an area under the curve of 400 or a trough concentration of greater than 10 to 15. So um, certainly there's situations where we do need to adjust dosages, but if you're treating a more resistant pathogen, or if you're dealing with a high clearance situation, then maybe empirically using higher dosages of fluconazole should be considered ideally in combination with therapeutic drug monitoring. What about the other triazoles? Well, other triazoles are less frequently used specifically for invasive candidiasis, but they may be part of a regimen that covers aspergillosis or mucormycosis. And we know voriconazole exhibits wide pharmacokinetic variability irrespective if you're in the ICU so routine therapeutic drug monitoring is always advised if it's available. For the other triazoles, in addition to voriconazole, posiconazole, and isofoconazole, we do have some um, accumulating evidence that the volume of distribution and clearance of these drugs is altered in patients at extreme uh, body weight, so very low body weight patients and also very high body weight patients. Uh, patients with hypoalbuminemia, Although there's some controversy because we don't measure necessarily free drug concentrations all the time of exactly how this should be interpreted. And certainly patients undergoing ECMO or renal replacement therapies, there's some suggestion the exposures may be lower. So if therapeutic drug monitoring is available, these are definitely situations where it should be considered to help guide dosing. The echinocandins are often first-line agents for uh, treatment of invasive candidiasis, and what have we learned about pharmacokinetic variability of these drugs? Well, with the older echinocandins, anidulofungin, caspofungin, and mycofungin, we know that exposures are often lower and possibly insufficient in patients who are obese, patients who have hypoalbuminemia, and also when you're treating isolates near the MIC breakpoint. So if you have a critically ill patient that has two or more of these factors, you could be dealing with a situation where the activity or exposure of the echinocandin is somewhat tenuous. Now, the more longer acting, more recently approved echinocandin resifungin does achieve much higher exposures. So there, there is not currently a recommendation for dosage adjustment in obese, elderly, or renally impaired patients. But we may learn more in the future in special situations where dosing adjustments could be indicated. So right now, I think that uh, most centers are not routinely doing TDM, and it's not something we routinely recommend, um, but uh, you can also balance this with the idea that echinocandins are generally well tolerated. So if you're dealing, for example, with a more obese patient, in many cases it will make more sense to just empirically increase the dose. If you had TDM available, that would be great uh, to confirm the exposures, but currently I think what most centers are following and what we recommend is to do empiric dosage adjustments, higher dosages in situations where you expect the exposures might be lower. And this is given more detail in the tables and the guidelines. We should also point out that there's some situations where echinocandin distribution is impaired and may be insufficient, such as infections in the central nervous system or vitreous fluid 
Echinocandins are large lipopeptide, highly protein-bound drugs, so they do not penetrate in these sites. Also, the drugs are not excreted unchanged in the urine, so this is a limitation. It can't be used for urinary candidiasis very effectively. But there's also some been discussion, are there some sites where the penetration is also suboptimal that may create a unique selection site for resistance, compartmentalization resistance is a, is a term that's used for this, such as in the peritoneum in patients with peritonitis. Um, Echinocandidins have been shown to be effective in some patients, but we also know the exposures may be suboptimal or delayed. Um, so this may be a contributor to resistance in some cases, and is certainly an area for future study and may have unique recommendations in the future. Also, candidate esophagitis, we've known for a long time that we often have to give higher dosages to clear um, the pathogens and biofilm from the esophagus. So these are areas to watch in the future for the future guidelines. What about liposomal amphotericin B and amphotericin B deoxycholate? Is there a role for TDM? Even though these are some of our oldest antifungals, they have very complex pharmacokinetic profiles, um, liposomal amphotericin B because of the liposomal carrier, and amphotericin B deoxycholate because it's a highly protein-bound insoluble compound, so it sort of gets dumped into deep tissue sites and then is slowly released. So it's very hard to make a clear correlation between a blood level and clinical outcome, even though we do know PKPD relationships exist from animal models and some limited human studies. So currently there's insufficient evidence for recommending impaired dosing adjustments based on TDM for these drugs, and I think most centers would not be doing TDM or recommending it for liposomal amphotericin B. It's sort of a research area. However, we do know there are case reports of special situations, such as ECMO, where particularly with the liposomal formulation of amphotericin B, the liposomes may be sequestered in oxygenator membranes. So this is a situation where we need to be very careful if you're using these drugs to treat invasive candidiasis. And if you can have drug levels monitored or confirmed, I think that would be ideal if this is the dr only drugs that can be used. The other thing to mention is that antifungal drug dosing in pediatrics and neonate patients is a highly specialized area. It could be its own session or talk. And certainly, um, we do not extrapolate from adult data because of the differences in infection pathophysiology and drug distribution. So there is a specific uh, tables addressing the dosing in pediatrics and neonates in the guidelines. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview. You can certainly find the full global guidelines for diagnosis and management of invasive candidiasis on the Lancet Infectious Diseases website. But I'd also like to point out that much of the additional drug information is found in the supplementary appendix. And so this is where you're going to really get into the weeds with drug dosing and patient populations where pharmacokinetic variability is the major problem. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and wish you a good day.